Hi, it's Darren. Welcome to 2022. I want to take you through my winter update, some charts, graphs, and information, a little bit of a history lesson, things we learned from 2021, and how I think we're going to apply those lessons in the year ahead. So let's jump into it. We'll begin where all the newscasts seem to begin, which is with COVID. So obviously we're still in the pandemic. In Ontario, where I am, we're still in another lockdown here in the uh, entering the second week of January, third week of January. So um, unfortunately, Omicron has kind of changed the game a little bit or actually made the game seem to repeat itself. Uh, there is some good news. I'm going to be using mostly U.S. data for today's presentation as the U.S. is the biggest market in the world. It's where we have most of our investments and it's really the barometer for everything else. Uh, so uh, as they go, tend, everybody else tends to go. So good news actually, uh, and I was talking to some of our clients who are physicians and I was talking to them about what to make of this Omicron thing. And some of them said, you know, if you're going to get a, a way to end this virus, it has to go through this process. And we're seeing a large number of uh, obviously case counts going up to the point where I don't even know why we bother counting them anymore. Um, but it's not as fatal. So much more uh, widespread, not as fatal. That's good, right? So we're going to obviously probably deal with more variants and other things. But um, this actually, despite the case counts going way up, uh, it looks like it's not as deadly. So hopefully uh, we're nearing the, uh, the end of uh, what we were going through the last couple of years with this, but we'll have to stay tuned. Um, but what have we seen? We saw markets obviously have done remarkably well in 2021. We had one of the best years uh, in our portfolios that we had in a very, very long time. Um, and, and some of the questions now are coming around, well, are things expensive? Are they overvalued? Well, just to give you a bit of a history lesson here, this is going back to 1996. So we got the 96 to 2000, the tech run up where we saw valuations, because that's how we try to determine if things are expensive, right? What's the price of them? So we saw valuations get high, they went back down. We saw the next big run up, because there's always a bull market after a bear market, um, where we saw the, the, the global financial credit system kind of go kind of wacky because they just pumped all this money. Um, we had that decline again because it reached a peak of earnings. And now uh, after that, they printed three to four trillion dollars and created the longest bull market the world has ever seen. Uh, then we got the pandemic. I would have argued that back in 2018, we were probably entering the seventh or eighth inning of this. Uh, then boom, we had this big drop when we shut down the world. And then that is amazing. The recovery from that is absolutely astonishing. And this was driven by a number of factors. One of them is just how much money did we print? And I'm going to show you in a second what we've done to give you an idea of where I think we might be headed. Um, one of the things, when we, again, when we talk about valuation is price to earnings. You'll hear this number quite often, which because stock prices follow earnings, right? So it's a question of what are people willing to pay? And we can see back in like 2000, people were willing to pay 25 times earnings. So if a company made a dollar, they were willing to pay $25. Make sense? Well, now we're paying about 21 times. So not as expensive as back here, more expensive than here, right? Um, but not as expensive as here. So what does all that mean? Well, one of the items you have to take into fact when you look at this is what were the level of interest rates? And back in 2000, because some people are saying, well, we're starting to approach these valuations from way back here. Well, but interest rates back then were 6%. Now they're one. So you have to run the math a little bit and understand that maybe this isn't as expensive because there just really aren't any other alternatives. So maybe if interest rates drop, the price for these things should be higher. Now, historically, uh, also, what do we see in a, in a different way to look at some of this data, are we expensive? Well, in a, in, a, in a range of where we normally would see price to earnings in the market, and by the way, I hate the term the market, I much prefer talking about wonderful businesses. And I'm gonna give you another illustration in a second as to why looking at the market can lead you to some wrong conclusions, but I'll start where I'm gonna start. Um, we are historically a little expensive. We were cheap two years ago, year and a half ago. But again, interest rates being where they are, it's hard to know really is this historically expensive because interest rates have never really been this low before. So um, I'm not entirely sure, but when I show you in a second what when we deconstruct this market determination, um, you're going to see that maybe there are some pockets of value and also things that are way, probably maybe too expensive. Uh, this chart really just shows us where, based on where we're starting from today with valuation, what's the right expectation for returns going forward. And we know that when we look at all these different um, points in time where we've seen uh, uh, valuations and what comes next, it's telling us that I think the reasonable expectation for most of us as investors is probably mid to high single digit returns, not the 15s and the 9s and the 20s, like whatever we saw the last year or two coming out of the lockdown, that's not the number, right? I think the right number to keep in your head is kind of mid to high single digits, and the data supports that. 
Okay. By the way, before I go on, I, you're going to see in the corner here J.P. Morgan. I, I get at this time of year in particular tons of chart books, lots of research from Raymond James, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, Royal Bank, Ev Fidelity. Everybody sends me stuff, and I read almost as much of it as I can possibly go through because there's a lot. And I find that over time, um, the guys, the chart package from J.P. Morgan is probably one of my favorite ones. So I tend to use it a lot. And I've, I've gotten very comfortable with how to read it because um, a lot of times they keep adding the same charts and it's probably about 170 charts in the book. Uh, but anyway, so you'll see that down there. I don't work for them, obviously. I don't buy their products, but I love their, their data. Uh, so very helpful. Okay, so again, I said stock prices follow earnings, right? So what did we see last year? Well, we saw earnings jump quite a lot, right? We had the pandemic, things shut down, companies shut down, everybody's scrambling to figure out what to do. So in 2021, we saw earnings come back dramatically. And when I mean dramatic, look at this. So the average earnings growth, obviously it's bumpy, right? This is the problem when you look at a river, it's only six inches deep, but not everywhere, right? So even though the average might be 6% earnings per share growth, companies driving their earnings forward by 6%, in aggregate, it was about 72%. Now, what's, here's what I'm going to ask you to watch for if you watch the business news. And once again, my caveat is please don't watch BNN unless I'm on it. I haven't been on it for years since they shut the studios down and they're all working from home. Uh, but what you're going to see, I think, from the financial press it, going forward, clearly this is, pr is not going to repeat itself. That's obviously historically a remarkable uh, number, again, coming out of the hole. But in the years coming up, they're going to refer to, well, hey, companies' earnings per share growth is behind where it was last year or the year before. They will express considerable astonishment that this doesn't repeat itself. That's why we're, don't, please don't watch the press. They have no idea what they're talking about at the time. Okay, so earnings per share have been very, very good. And that's been terrific. But remember I said before around when we look at the index, we have to be careful when we look at kind of from the top, we have to look at it a little bit more and do a bit of an x-ray to see what's going on. And there is a bit of danger that we have to be looking for here. And, and we've talked about this in the past, and it's how the index is constructed. On TV, when they talk about the S&P 500, as most of you know, that's the 500 largest companies in the United States, most of which you would know. But the weighting is weighted by size of company. So largest business is number one, second largest business number two, and so on. So when you look at it from that perspective, we're going to see it's maybe not as diversified as people thought. And Canadians got a real lesson in this in 1999 where that measurement, uh, that weighting mechanism they use led to JDS, Uniphase, and Nortel being about 40% of our market, which was great on the way up because those two stocks pulled the whole index up and anybody buying ETFs or index funds saw, wow, look at all the money I'm making on this diversified portfolio of 300 companies. Well, except it wasn't. It was really two doing all the work. And that was great on the way up until it ends, right? And there's something called Stein's Law, which says if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Think about that. So when that began to roll off, that same weighting mechanism that saw that overweight created an acceleration effect on the way down, and it was horrible. But if you ignored that or you're aware of that and you did some proper investment uh, in portfolio construction and didn't let your portfolio get out of whack and out of weight, uh, you actually went through that okay. So what we're seeing today in the US market is not quite as extreme as that, but something we really need to be mindful of, that the top 10 companies, so these are going to be the Apples and the Facebooks, these guys are driving, they're so popular, they're driving all the waiting. And Warren Buffett had a great line, or has a great line, where he says, in the short term, the market is a voting machine, and it votes for what's popular. But in the long term, it's a weighing machine, and it weighs value. So let's look and see what's popular. So we're seeing this popularity contest where, remember when I talked about PEs and valuation? Well, those top 10 stocks, look at how much more expensive they are than the other 490. So people are really paying up for owning these things. So these things, uh, now I'm not going to predict the future, but I am going to let you know that by measurement, these are expensive. On average, they're 33 times earnings. Everything else is about 20 times earnings. So that drives that whole thing up. So um, that's an issue to pay, to pay attention to. If we buy the index, we're really placing our bets on stuff that's already expensive. And what's the oldest rule of investing? Buy, sell, you already know. Uh, and the weighting of those things is driving that whole index up and we've been watching this for the last few years. Very, very hard to try and go against this, this trend, but certainly we, it's now reaching a peak where about uh, almost a third of the return from the S&P 500 is coming to the, from those 10 stocks. 
So that's a challenge. And those 10 stocks also are in technology, right, which pays almost no dividends. And if you look and say, well, I want to diversify portfolio, Darren, I want to not place all my eggs in one basket, okay, but then 30% of the money is in one basket, whereas energy is 3%, financials are only 10, uh, communications 10, real estate's 3, healthcare's 13, consumer staples like toothpaste and stuff, that's only about 6. So clearly, that's a big overweight, and it's just it's grown to become that. So if we're trying to track the S&P 500 as our return, that's not the right bogey, I'm going to argue. If we want to manage risk, we're not going to be chasing that, okay? Um, so let's talk finances. So the federal government, again, I'm going to use the United States. It's actually getting hard to get the data from Canada, unfortunately, but the U.S., look what they've spent. Look what they've done to their balance sheet. We've not seen, and this has been going on for a long time, but it's reached such a crescendo. Like we saw after 08 and 07, uh, 07, 08, 09, look at the amount of money they increased because of the financial crisis. And then it's gone vertical. So unbelievable that net federal debt is 100% of their GDP. Uh, and that's not including all the states and the municipalities. And the last time it was this high, it went over 100%, was fighting World War II. Think about that, we're fighting a virus. I guess that's our new world war, right? Um, a lot of that money, though, has gone in households, not all of it clearly, and it's not obviously widely distributed, but certainly in aggregate, uh, American households, not so much, Canadians have done a pretty good job of taking that money and putting it in their bank accounts and paying off debt, but Americans have done a great job, so this is a bit of a good news story to me, is that they're, they've paid down their liabilities, so their debts are not extravagant, most of it's in their houses, right? Um, but look at what they've done in their assets. They're, and it's not just all homes. That's one of the challenges with Canadian data is that a lot of the assets are in homes. And that's, I guess, great, but that might not be good. Stein's Law, something cannot go on forever. It will stop. Um, so very uh, good looking balance sheet for the average American uh, uh, consumer. They paid off a lot of their debt. Their debt servicing is very good. Uh, and I mentioned this in one of my walking with Charlie's. I'm getting a bit worried when I hear the finance minister and the, and the prime minister of Canada say, hey, we don't really need to worry about all the debt we created because we can still afford the payments. Okay, um, I, I, I have six financial planning designations and I'm not even going to begin to tell you how bad that answer is. But in the United States, the average American family has really done a good job of paying down debt. Now, I'd also argue that after 2008, 2009, they had so much debt, a lot of them went broke and everybody that was going to go broke probably did. But they clearly have good room to respond. They're not overextended and their household net worth is, is all-time highs. So those are good news stories that we see there. Um, one big problem, and I'm going to get into what I believe now is the, going to be the defining feature of your financial planning and financial situation for the next decade, which is inflation. Now remember, inflation is too much money chasing too few things, okay? We've begun measuring inflation. You can see the spike that we've seen. Now I've been saying for a long time that this is a risk because I don't even believe they report the numbers in the way that you and I experience them. And we're seeing now inflation have this huge spike. It's also very illustrative for us because we have clients in Canada and the United States. Canadian retired clients that get things like OAS are going to see an increase in their payments of about two and a half ish percent this year in 2022. Our American clients, their social security benefits are going to go up by 5.9. So about two and a half, six. What do the Americans know that we don't know? Or what are they doing for their numbers that we're not doing in our numbers? Um, and it's astonishing to me, because I don't think Canada is a cheaper place to live, and our Canadian clients know that it's not. So how is it that they're going to increase their government benefit payments by 6% and we're like just over a third of that? I don't, I don't quite understand how this works. Thank gosh I'm not in government, because it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and I do believe that those numbers aren't really what you and I are experiencing in our real lives. Anyway. Um, but I want to show you where I think this train is headed, okay? So I'm going to give you, please stay with me on the finance class. Uh, this is how uh, inflation is calculated. So it's how much money is there, so how much fuel, how fast is it cycling through the economy, how fast is the engine running, okay? And then what does that equal in terms of prices and output, output being GDP? Let me simplify this a little bit so we'll get our scratch pad out and do a little bit of functions and things. And what you're going to discover at the basics of this is uh, inflation equals how fast is the engine running and how much money is there, right? So how much money, how fast is it going through the system? That's all you really need to know. So the two inputs, well, let's have a look at them, all right? So here's the first input. I'm just going to give you a second to think about that. 
This is going back to 1960. This is the amount of money that's in circulation in the United States. It's called M1 money supply. It's the most basic measurement of how much money is there. Look at this. Very steady state, responsible central bankers, right? Keeping a pretty good lid on this, expanding it a bit, expanding, keeping inflation reasonably under control. And then what did we do? It is amazing to me that this chart, I bet you've never seen this before, right? I can't believe this isn't on the front page of every newspaper. And this comes from the Federal Reserve uh, of the United States. It comes from the St. Louis Fed. I can't believe that this data, easily available, you can find it on Google in 10 seconds. I can't believe this isn't been followed by every reporter. This is, okay, so that's one half of the equation, right? That's how much fuel is there to drive inflation. So we know one, sub, one of the variables in that equation is massively loaded to generate inflation. Let's look at the other one, velocity. Well, it fell off a cliff here, look at that. And that's because we shut down the world in 2000, right? So that's why now this is finally starting to come back. We're reopening the economy in some places. We had a bit of a, a movement ahead to do that. Now, for example, in Ontario, we backed off again, but other places are going through this. So we're starting to see this come back one of the challenges, though, is that people aren't able to buy all the stuff they want to buy because we have other disruptions in, product, in production and supply chain, so which is inhibiting just how much people can buy, right? Like, no one got a PS5 for Christmas, uh, and, the, and the transistor microchip shortage we talked about is leading to, it's harder to get cars, it's harder to get stuff. So they'd probably be buying even more if they could go to all the malls, be within six feet of each other everywhere, and buy all the stuff. But, so we're starting to see this come back up again. So remember, the first part of that equation has gone completely off the charts. We've never seen anything like that. Uh, and now this also unprecedented, but this is starting to turn. When this starts to go, I don't think they can pull the money out fast enough. So anybody on TV that says, well, we think inflation is transitory. I'm like, can you, do you have access to the internet? Can you not see this stuff? Um, that's impossible. Now, we will see pockets of, of areas where things may have gotten too expensive because of production challenges. You know, there's still dozens and dozens of ships off the coast of San Diego, Los Angeles, Vancouver that can't get into the ports to get their stuff off. That's part of that supply chain disruption. Um, but clearly, we've baked in the cake all the pieces we need to see very significant inflation, rising costs, rising lifestyle costs, rising purchasing power, or falling purchasing power, I should say. Um, now, the Fed in the U.S. and Canada also, they're going to try and take some of that money out of the system. They only have one tool, right, which is do they raise interest rates? So Canada's already said they're going to start. Whether they do or not, we'll see. But the Bank of Canada already said they would. Um, and we can see where we think the Fed is going to increase interest rates in the U.S. One key part here is we're not going back to six. So they're still going to remain in an absolute sense uh, very low. But for bond investors, for the bond market, this is going to be very problematic because on a, on a percentage basis, they're now into like quantum physics, right? So even going from like 0.13 to 1.6, that doesn't, that's not a big nominal move, but on a percentage basis, that's massive. And bonds are priced based on formulas. So this is going to be very problematic for the bond market, um, which is good. One of the reasons why we're mostly equity investors is I don't want to go near this stuff because all the headwinds are, are at them. Uh, and also, too, there's no return in those things. So this is the difference between nominal yield and real yield. So this is the rate of the bond pays, and this is after you factor in inflation. And so right now, for example, um, the, the bonds are paying like one and a half, but if inflation's running at 3.5, and actually, remember I told you it's actually probably closer to six? So that means that, or sorry, inflation's at five. Um, but I think it's actually, again, the government in the U.S. is raising the rates higher than that. The net, it's a negative three and a half percent return or worse so even though it says, hey, we'll give you your dollar back, it's only going to buy 96, 95 cents worth of stuff a year from now. So that's a real loss of purchasing power. Uh, this isn't going to be good. The other thing I want to point out, and I've showed you this type of chart before, is that all of the, the portfolio construction techniques that are built into the software programs that the regulators use was all based on interest rates going from 15, 16% down to 1%. Now, in that environment, that's a 40-year bull market in bonds because interest rates, when they go down, bonds go up. They act in the opposite direction. So all the software that says, well, as you get older, you should be putting more, more of your money into bonds, all of you were programmed with that belief system, right? And I still hear that. People are like, oh, I'm retiring. I gotta put, I'm getting older. I've got to put more of my money into bonds. Well, that comes from this. If, if, I don't, if, if that doesn't tell you things are over, I don't know what over looks like. So we really have to go back to fundamentals and say this is not going to repeat itself because this isn't going to this, I don't think. So if we get flat or even something like this, 
how much money should you have in fixed income? Because it's going to lose money mathematically. I think for many people the answer is there and as little as possible. So it's really upending a lot of what people thought about how they should be investing, especially as they get to retirement. Okay, moving on. Um, we're predominantly global investors with a heavy overweight to US and why? Well, Canada represents 3% of all the global investments that are out there in terms of uh, stocks and bonds and things. So, well, stocks specifically. Uh, the US is about 61%. So we already start off with that. We live next door to the largest shopping mall in the world, so that's where most of our investments are. Um, and the US clearly has been the winner, if you just look at region, about where to invest. But one thing I want to point out to you, we're paying close attention to, uh, and we have a number of investment managers that are global that really give me good data and good information, is the growth of the middle class, right? And we're worried in North America and Western economies about you know, wealth inequality or wealth polarization, the rich getting richer. I'm not going to get into that debate because some of that stuff I think is more political than real. Um, but one of the things that isn't uh, 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 fake is the fact that a lot of, of countries are seeing their middle class wealth being more widely dispersed in places like India, China, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico. This is very important to watch because we generally know what happens when, when economies, when families get more wealth, what do they tend to do with it? What do they tend to buy? So as this is really starting to happen, and look at how rapidly it's changing. Like this is 2020, and this is India. This is what we think in 2030. The middle class is gonna go from 21% of the population to 79%. So this has tremendous effects on where money goes, right? So the Wayne Gretzky analogy, you just follow the puck. Right? Go where the puck is going. So this is interesting. So we're paying close attention to this and how it manifests into how we allocate. A um, couple of other things I want to share with you. As most of you know, I, I really am a believer in uh, owning things like real estate and infrastructure because it's a place where we could have long life, hard to replace assets and get a very strong income from them and that income rises through time. So JP Morgan put this chart in. So I just want to show you where we can get some other yields to try because interest rates from bonds are non-existent really, so how do we get a better return? So things like real estate, infrastructure, they're yielding like four, 4.8 percent. So we're finding places we can get income that's more aligned to what you're going to need and, and importantly that income is rising at or better the rate of inflation. So we have to maintain purchasing power. Um, now this chart, a little hard to read, but I want to walk you through this. Because sometimes people think, well, shouldn't I maybe do an asset allocation model or should I be trying to rotate? Like go to what's popular, go to what's hot, and then move to the next thing. Well, this is an example of why that's almost impossible. So this is what has been the best performing category, worst performing category, uh, and then as they move around. And one of the things we often see is that what may have been um, a top performer winds up being a lousy performer. And this line that goes through this is an asset allocation approach, where you own a little bit of everything and you're just trying to stay in the middle, right? You're never going to be bragging to everybody, but hey, I owned, well, unless you put all your money in one thing, which is not the smartest thing to do in the long term, but trying to figure out this, you often wind up down here. The much more logical approach is to have a solid plan and have your portfolio just try and stay in the middle. I joke that I try to invest like I wish I could play golf. And Dave, if you're watching this, you and I know I haven't hit a fairway in a long time, so, but I do in the portfolios, okay? Um, so that's why we take that approach. The other thing is you know, I'm a big believer in dividends, right? Dividends to me provide the best foundation for building a proper portfolio. And the reason I, sh I say that, and I've shown you this chart before, is that in every decade, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, this blue line is what the dividends uh, were as part of the return. And in every decade we want to look at, dividends always generated a positive return. So you build from there. Whereas price return, how much things went up, some years it contributed, or some decades contributed a lot to your return, other years not so much. Other years, like the 2000s, well, if you didn't have dividends, you didn't have anything. So to me, that's why we start with a foundation of dividends. The other thing is, again, we talked about inflation and, and protecting your purchasing power. The tools to do that are pretty straightforward, right? It's not gold and Bitcoin and stuff. I know people think that, but it's actually, they haven't done their math. And I did a whole video a couple summers ago uh, explaining why gold is, one of, is not a hedge for inflation, despite what people think. It's, if they've done their work, they'll know that that's not true. The best inflation hedges are blue chip dividends, real property, real estate, real uh, uh, infrastructure, and some commodities. That's about it, right? So that's where we focus. Good news for you is as inflation is coming hard, we're already really good at knowing how to deal with that. So um, I think that's a positive thing. 
Uh, all right, thank you for sticking with me through this whole uh, uh, explanation. And this is just some of the charts I look at. I won't bore you with all of them, obviously. But four real messages to take from this. The first thing, unfortunately, sadly, the virus isn't done with us. But I'm really hoping that um, we're starting to see things get better. So I'm hopefully we're, this is the end of at least the beginning of that. Uh, and there are going to be new variants. And I, and I mentioned in my Christmas uh, or my New Year's message, I should, should say, um, I really believe that the, the one lesson all of us should have taken from 2020 and 2021 is resiliency, right? That ability to keep moving forward, keep our families and our lives moving forward despite the adversity. And we just, hopefully we've all gotten a bit better at that because we're still going to need it, right? Um, we're going to stay invested, right? They pumped so much money into the global economy. And in one of my walks with Charlie, I mentioned that, you know, if you look back at 2008, they put three to four trillion dollars in the global economy, central bankers and governments. That created the longest and biggest bull market the world's ever seen. They've now printed close to 20 trillion. So you tell me what's coming next. We haven't had volatility for a while. We're going to get some. It's going to scare you. It's going to be out of nowhere. I can't predict it. I'm not going to waste any time trying to. Neither should you. We're just going to stay invested. We're going to pay attention to where, where I think there's value, where I think there's things that are too expensive. But we're going to stay invested because all that money's got to go somewhere. Uh, inflation really is the issue uh, and, and what that means to your purchasing power. So we're looking for investments and strategies that respond positively in that environment. But everything's going to be expensive. Your lifestyle costs are going to go up. I'm having Vicki dial up her inflation uh, numbers in all of our plans to try and somehow model what that might look like. Uh, this will be positive actually for most risk assets though. And so we're going to have to stay invested to stay ahead of all of your rising costs. And one thing I've said in the press, I've said in the Globe and Mail, and I've, I've mentioned this on a regular basis, our job is not to protect your dollar. Our job is to protect what your dollar buys. Funny joke, I mentioned that to a new client recently, and he said, can you protect uh, my dollar from what my wife buys? So I hope you like that joke. That's not my joke, somebody else's. Um, and where do we go from here? Well, first of all, in the portfolios on my side, we stay diversified. We do not place our bets on any one thing. Indeed, all the math says, all the evidence is, chasing last year's winners is probably going to give me all of this year's losers. We do not do that. We take a dis disciplined, diversified approach, and we keep on planning, right? All of your working assumptions keep changing. We have to keep changing with them. Um, I'm glad that um, uh, Nick is working on his CFP. Uh, Vicky's got, got all the files. She's all ready to go. Uh, Neil and I pulled have our CFP hats all tightened up for this year, and I think we're getting closer to finding Andrew's replacement. So um, that really is how we're going to get through all of what's coming. So with that, I'm going to thank you for staying tuned. As always, any questions or comments, please let me know. Let the team know. We're very grateful for you, and I want to wish you a wonderful 2022. Talk soon.